Laura is a fellow at the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford uh, Law School, um, at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation, and she is also a by fellow uh, of Churchill College at University of Cambridge in England. Um, and, and the book that she's going to talk to you about is The Cost of Counterterrorism, um, which is, is uh, one of the most enlightening and interesting and somewhat depressing books that, uh, that I have read in some time. Um, um, Laura, Laura has published dozens of scholarly articles, uh, lots of chapters and edited volumes and um, was at the John F. Kennedy School for, for some time. So join me in welcoming Laura, and, who will talk to us about, uh, about her book and also will take some questions from you all. So big welcome to Laura. Thanks very much, Kim. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Google for inviting me here today and, and thank Kim uh, and Sylvia Chacon for setting this up. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, and I've been particularly looking forward to coming to Google uh, for two reasons. First, Stanford Law School, we actually have a very close relationship with Google. We have many of our graduates actually work here, including David Drummond and Kent Walker, who also serve on our Board of Visitors. Uh, Google has been very supportive of our Center for Internet and Society. In fact, we co-hosted a conference in March together on legal futures. Josh Cohen, who's a professor at Stanford Law School, teaches here. And there are many more formal and informal connections. Uh, the second reason, uh, I was particularly looking forward to a conversation here on the book uh, is because the company actually has a critical role to play in the evolution of national security law at many different levels. Indeed, Google is on the cutting edge of many of the issues that I discuss in the book. These issues are of great importance for what I'd like to suggest today is that the United States is at a critical point. What happens will play out in the constitutional structure of the country. For the single most defining feature of counter-terrorist law is expanded executive authority. And this has implications for the balance of power within the state, for individual rights, for the relationship of the citizens to the state itself. Over the past 40 years, counter-terrorist initiatives in the United States, uh, and indeed in the United Kingdom as well, despite unique constitutional, legal, and political contexts, have brought with them profound costs many of which have been lost in the shadow of this dominant framework that we use to think about counter-terrorist law, security or freedom. And it's not just hypertrophic executive power that doesn't appear in this security or freedom di dichotomy, but it also ignores, in its narrow terms of reference, the many broader political, social and economic effects of these provisions. The alienation of the domestic and international community, for instance, uh, bureaucratic inefficiencies. If you look at our anti-terrorist finance provisions, we've had a sudden uh, increase in the number of suspicious activity reports, for instance, that are being filed. And a lot of this is because the anti-terrorist finance provisions adopted post 9-11 have emphasized the use of money laundering mechanisms. The problem is that money laundering basically takes clean, or Try, basically takes dirty money and tries to make it clean, whereas anti-terrorist finance takes clean money and tries to make it dirty. And you have very different phenomenon going on between anti-terrorist finance and money laundering. And so many of the devices and mechanisms that we use for money laundering are inappropriate. Suspicious activity reports, which are now being used for anti-terrorist finance, have more than quadrupled in the United States, with the result that now we are having difficulty even finding money launderers uh, in the United States. We've also interrupted commercial activity, and I have many examples that I give of these types of phenomena in the book itself. One lighter example would be tourism, for instance. We're now $52 billion down from where we were in 2001 at a time when our closest allies, many of whom also have been subjected to terrorist attacks, have actually doubled or tripled uh, their tourism intakes during that time. The security or freedom dichotomy also makes certain assumptions about rights versus security, one of which is that rights are uh, not connected. So it's one right that we're giving up in exchange for security. But in fact, when you have examples such as free speech and due process, if you narrow free speech rights and you have uh, detention processes that are, that are otherwise ordinary, you can use free speech, which otherwise would be protected, to detain individuals. And similarly, if you waive your due process requirements, even if you don't change your free speech, you can actually detain individuals based on a wide range of otherwise protected activities. 
focusing on these costs does not mean that no benefits accrue from counter-terrorist law. Uh, it's important to recognize where security has been gained. Indeed, in the United States, since 9-11, we haven't seen a terrorist attack on domestic soil. In the United Kingdom, they've been able to interrupt a number of terrorist cells uh, as well. This doesn't mean that every counter-terrorist provision is responsible for these gains in security. Uh, that would be sloppy logic if we started to adopt that kind of an approach. Um, but calculating these benefits is an essential part of understanding the counter-terrorist regime. I'm not discussing these benefits. That's not what I'm focusing on here. Uh, instead, I'm focusing on the costs and the assumptions of the security or freedom framework. And I'm suggesting that the damage that has been caused to the United States and the United Kingdom is significantly greater than it first appears. These two countries, moreover, are leading global counterterrorist norms, and they risk the transfer of these detrimental effects to other states, other liberal democratic states who are fighting terrorism. Furthermore, it's in response to conventional attacks that we've seen these changes over the last four decades. The proliferation of nuclear and biological materials and their impact on the calculus behind the security side of the equation may take both states to take increasingly extreme measures. The result could be a shift in the basic structure of both states. So what I'm going to suggest is that it's a counter-terrorist spiral, not a pendulum, that, counter that characterizes counter-terrorist law. And I'll explain what I mean by that. In this spiral, we have expanded executive authority, and we have a failure on the part of the legislature and the judiciary to limit the executive as it expands. So let's for look first at expanded executive authority. In the United States, I'll give two examples. Uh, property rights and surveillance are two good examples. What I, what I did in the book was I broke up uh, counter-terrorist measures into five basic areas, life, liberty, property, privacy, and free speech, and looked at provisions that affected these rights under the security or freedom rubric, and tried to figure out what their real costs have been of all of these types of measures. So if you look at property rights, just after 9-11, the president issued in the United States uh, an executive order, Executive Order 13224. Under this order, you can, the president was empowered to list specially designated global terrorists, this is a new creation, that an individual could be listed with no underlying evidence of any criminal act, no underlying evidence of any terrorist activity, simply because the president designated that individual. And anybody associated with somebody suspected of terrorism could have their assets indefinitely frozen. So I know Kim. If Kim is suspected of terrorism, my assets can be frozen. Now, this has largely escaped public discussion. This, what happens underneath this statute, uh, the IEPA, under the Patriot Act, not only can this happen, but any evidence is kept secret. It's classified. So you don't even know why. You're not given notice. You're not given a hearing. You're not given an opportunity to object to it. You don't have access to the information. You don't know what the charges are against you. And you don't have access to your assets. Under Executive Order 13224, if you relieve humanitarian suffering caused by this order, you are in criminal violation of the order. So you can't even relieve. If somebody is starving because of this order and you give them a bowl of soup, you violated the law under this statute. This is an extraordinary power. And it shows the extent to which the executive has really grown in strength post 9-11 that this type of an order can be introduced and in fact is operational currently. Surveillance is another good example of uh, the growth in executive strength post 9-11. We hear a lot about the Patriot Act, and the Patriot Act really has three main surveillance provisions uh, that I would uh, focus on for counterterrorism. First is the changes to FISA. This was under Section 215. The introduction of what's called delayed notice search warrants. Uh, some people call them sneak and peek warrants. That's the more kind of pejorative way to refer to them. Uh, delayed notice search warrant uh, basically allows uh, the government to go into somebody's home to search. Uh, and to leave and never tell them that they were there. These were illegal uh, in the McCarthy era. This was one of, seen as one of the worst uh, kind of excesses uh, in Operation COINTELPRO, which the FBI uh, used the Socialist Workers' Party cases. There's a whole string of cases where the courts condemn this. This is now legal under the Patriot Act. 80% uh, of the cases in which sneak and peek or delayed notice search warrants have been issued have had nothing to do with terrorism by the government's own numbers because the Patriot Act doesn't tie these provisions to terrorism. 
The third change is the extended use of national security letters, Section 505 of the Patriot Act. Uh, under the NSL provisions, this is basically a letter that comes from the Attorney General and is issued to a company like Google uh, where they ask for information. There's no prior judicial scrutiny of these uh, administrative subpoenas. And what ends up happening is any one letter can demand millions of records. So they could come to Google, serve Google with a letter, and say, we'd like all of your internet traffic between January 1st, 2000 and January 1st, 2005. Um, and and we want to know everybody who went through your servers, all the information and so on. And by the way, you're gagged from telling anybody that you've been served with an order. Uh, if you do, you're in criminal violation of the statute, uh, the 2004 Defense Authorization Act. In many ways, now national security letters also, there were up to 40,000 of these being issued per year. Now remember, any one of these letters can get millions of records. Just after 9-11, the Attorney General issued uh, guidelines saying that they'd like all information obtained from NSLs kept and data mined to generate new knowledge. So NSLs, uh, the Inspector General of the FBI later found that many of these were being misused. They weren't just being used for terrorism, they were being used more broadly, there was no follow-up being conducted, so on and so forth. Now, in many ways, the USA Patriot Act is just the, a poster child for what else is going on. And one of the bigger surveillance kind of programs in place is actually coming out of the Department of Defense. Uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the NSA telephone surveillance programs, the NSA is part of DOD. Uh, we all now know that the NSA has been monitoring telephone conversations. Uh, we uh, also know that the threat and local observation notice program was being run by DOD, which grew out of Operation Eagle Eyes. Talon, which is Threat and Local Observation Notice, collects information on U.S. citizens or groups or anybody deemed a threat to the national security of the United States. This included protesters passing out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to protest Halliburton's war profiteering. This included Outlaw, which is a group at Stanford Law School uh, and at many law schools, which is a group of uh, gay and lesbian, uh, bisexual and transsexual students uh, known as Outlaw. They were uh, actually, people went to their meetings, took notes on them, entered them into the data base and it was the, the notes were very we got this through a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request. It was found that uh, the term outlaw meant to break the law was the note in the military record. So clearly these individuals are out to break the law. Uh, and then they said they used a conventional search engine to find uh, if there was another meaning for this term outlaw and they couldn't find it. So I thought, well, I wonder what would happen if I Googled outlaw law schools. And within 1.4 seconds, I had 400,000 hits of outlaw groups describing this you know, decades old lesbian, gay, bisexual law student association. So in fact, when I used a conventional search engine, I had no trouble identifying what these outlaw groups were, but the military um, had a different take on it. It's not just Talon that's uh, operating CIFA counterintelligence field activity, whose motto is reported to be counterintelligence to the edge, is a new intelligence gathering uh, operation where they take information from law enforcement, from the FBI, from the CIA, DIA, all the different agencies, and they run it together to try to look at what's happening, try to create social network analysis and patterns. Uh, their budget is classified. Uh, we know that they've spent more than one billion over the first four years. They now have nine directorates. Um, and this is another military effort. Uh, there's also uh, two intelligence gathering centers in the United States now that NORTHCOM runs, gathering intelligence. And the one that's in some ways of most concern, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which is run out of DOD, uh, has announced that it's collecting, uh, it's mapping the 133 largest cities in the United States down to the political affiliation of every inhabitant of every home. It is not just DOD, though, that's expanding in terms of executive strength in the surveillance realm. If you look at the Attorney General guidelines, which have been issued post 9-11, uh, they considerably weakened uh, the different stages of investigation and the standards that would have to be met for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, we have Carnivore, Magic Lantern, which is a keystroke program that can be entered onto individuals' computers to recreate documents that they write. And we have very little information about how often or frequently this is being used. It's come up in some court documents just tangentially, but we have no information about how this is actually being used. There's TIPS, the Terrorism Information and Prevention System, 
uh, which was announced. Uh, it was a DOJ reporting program that would have had one in every 24 Americans collecting information on other Americans uh, until a reporter from Sydney, Australia, actually, uh, kind of broke the story and it became bigger news. And then they dissolved the program but continued many of the pilot programs introduced under it, like Highway Watch, Marine Watch, uh, and so on. And the idea was to have individuals who have access to people's homes, to uh, areas that the government might not already have eyes, have them report the information back to Washington so that they could collect information on what's happening. Uh, the data mining programs that are in place have also increased. Uh, in 2004, the General Accounting Office found that of 128 agencies, there were 199 data mining operations in place. 14 of these related to counterterrorism. So the CIA was running Octopus and Quantum Leap. The DIA was running Insight Smart Discovery and Pathfinder. The Department of Education was running Project Strike Back. Uh, DHS uh, ran Notebook I2 uh, and so on. And of course, we have total information awareness. And I'm, I'm a little bit curious, how many of you are aware of total information awareness of this program? So not, not many. So Total Information Awareness was a program started by John Poindexter um, after 9-11. And the aim of this program was to take all privately held databases and publicly held databases, put them together, and data mine it to try to generate new knowledge, new information. Uh, the US government, we have an official logo office, which actually gives every department their own logo. And the logo chosen for, DI for TIA is, is really telling. It's a, pyramid uh, with the, you know, the Illuminati pyramid with the eye, and the gaze is cast over the entire globe. And it says, scientia es potentia, knowledge is power. And around the outside of the logo, it says, total information awareness. And this was our official government logo for this program that was in place. Um, what ended up happening to TIA was uh, John Poindexter also started a futures market on the next terrorist attack uh, and the next dictator that would be assassinated. And he was, this program was shut down, but the research programs underneath TIA continued. Many of them did. If you look at the names of the programs, um, and I discuss these you know, in more detail in the book, you actually can trace their transfer to DIA, to CIA, to NSA, and to other agencies. And much of the research is actually continuing that was initiated under TIA. There are also a number of federal watch lists that have now evolved. As of 9-11, there were 16 people on a no transport list. Um, as of uh, within, uh, let's see, by April of 2005, there were 70,000 people on this list. There were actually two lists. There was the no-fly list and then the selectee list. On the no-fly list, these individuals are not allowed to fly at all. On the selectee list, you're actually uh, just separated off and subjected to further scrutiny before you're allowed to fly. The rapid proliferation of names on this list led many uh, in the federal government itself to question flying commercial. There are some great emails that, were, again, were uncovered from FOIA requests that show government officials saying, gosh, how do you get on the list? How do you get off the list? I'm not flying commercial anymore, you know, because it wasn't clear how these lists were developing. Uh, this was only one of many. There are now more than a dozen watch lists that have been introduced at a federal level. So these are just two examples, property rights and surveillance provisions and privacy issues uh, in terms of how the executive has gained in strength. Uh, now what about the legislature? How effective has the legislature been in offsetting what's happening? Well, the answer is not very. Um, and the reason why has something to do with the dynamics of counterterrorism specifically. And they're not unique to the United States. So the legislature could really check the executive at one of three points. They could check the executive at the point uh, at which the legislation is introduced. They could do it in their oversight provisions. Or they could do it in the continuation of temporary counterterrorist law. But at none of those points is the legislature actually performing their functions. So let's look first at the introduction of these provisions. Counterterrorist law is, is almost uniformly introduced right after a terrorist attack. Immediately, the legislators uh, fear being seen as weak, as not being able to respond. They've been found wanting in their ability to protect the life and property of the citizens. And it is their job, their duty to act and to be seen to act to answer that attack. And this is universal. So in 1922, just to pick one example, in Northern Ireland, 428 people had died from political violence in Northern Ireland. And right away, the government introduced the 1922 Civil Authority Special Powers Act. Now, that legislation empowered the civil authority to inter alia uh, impose curfew, close premises, roads, and transportation routes, to detain and intern, to alter the court system, to uh, 
introduce new powers of search and seizure to take all such steps and issue all such orders as may be necessary to main pa maintain peace and order. Now this one clause in the Special Powers Act led to over 100 regulations that ranged from preventing gatherings or marches to making it illegal to wear an Easter lily. This was one of the ones, they, it was illegal to sing a soldier song and so on. There was extensive regulations. This kind of omnibus character is very typical of counter-terrorist law. And so after 9-11, uh, when we saw with the Patriot Act this kind of enormous legislation that went through, that's very typical of how countries respond. What's interesting about the nature of the provisions is that pr provisions that previously were rejected often pass the next time through. So after Oklahoma City in 1995, efforts to expand the FBI's investigative powers failed only to go fly through the legislature right after 9-11. Similarly, roving wiretaps were rejected in 1996 for the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in the United States. These are uh, wiretaps that stay not with a phone number but with an individual. So if somebody uses a phone uh, or a, a different phone, like no matter what phone they use, you can tap whatever that device or instrument is. These were rejected. These went right through in the Patriot Act. Oftentimes, uh, they actually even go further. So uh, in Oma, for instance, prior to the Oma bombing in Northern Ireland, uh, there were efforts to try to make it uh, possible for the government to seize property used in the commission of a terrorist attack. After Oma, not only did they allow the government to seize the property, but they said even if the owner didn't know that their property was being used in the per to further terrorism, then their property can be seized. What's interesting is extraordinary procedures are used right after the terrorist attack when these provisions are introduced. Uh, and this is what, what's critical about this is these extraordinary provisions are introduced, extraordinary powers, extraordinary procedures, before you even know what went wrong. So there's no inquiry generally before new counter-terrorist provisions are put into place. So the USA Patriot Act uh, bypassed committee markup. It went straight behind closed doors. The House held only one hearing. The Attorney General was the only witness. At 3.45 a.m. on October 12th, on the morning of the vote, the bill reached a final print. Many of the legislators didn't even have time to read the legislation before they had to vote thumbs up or thumbs down. The Speaker of the House ruled the one legislator who tried to raise an amendment out of order, and that bill went through the legislature. The 1974 Prevention of Terrorism Act, much the same story. It was introduced after the Birmingham bombings in the United Kingdom. Uh, this legislation received royal assent three days after it was introduced, which was only four days after the bombings themselves. Uh, again, two weeks after OMA in Northern Ireland, you had the Criminal Justice Terrorism and Conspiracy Bill, which was laid before Parliament, and it received royal assent in less than 48 hours. So it's very typical that you have these abbreviated procedures. What happens is in these abbreviated timelines, what uh, legislators try to do is they say, all right, well, we have this extraordinary power, but it's only for a short time, and it's only for this particular threat that we face. And so we're going to make these powers, the most egregious ones, temporary. The problem is that they rarely turn out to be so. And this is the second point where the legislature could check the executive in their exercise of these authorities, and they don't, and they can't. Uh, because in order to repeal the provisions, you have to say, well, by repealing these, terrorist attack is no longer possible, uh, or it's no longer likely. But it's very hard to prove that in a liberal democratic state where this kind of thing is always possible. And so they become a baseline. And then the next time there's a terrorist attack, the measures ratchet up, and they ratchet up, and they ratchet up, and you have an expansion in counter-terrorist provisions. Many of these powers, moreover, seep over into other areas of the law. And so, for instance, uh, in the United Kingdom, single judge tribunals with no juries were introduced for terrorism crimes. These are now used for complex fraud, uh, for cr uh, certain, uh, certain financial crimes in the United Kingdom, and they came from the counterterrorism realm. In fact, by the mid-80s, 60% of the cases coming before Diplock courts had nothing to do with terrorism. They were simply there by nature of the crime that was charged, such as murder or, or shooting or any sort of crime that was otherwise associated with terrorism. Uh, same thing uh, in the United States. If you look at our anti-terrorist finance provisions and our drug crime, uh, if you look at our money laundering provisions, you see a ratcheting effect going back and forth, and it's the same in the United Kingdom. So what happens is, you'll have money laundering, new money laundering initiatives, and then that gets transferred over into anti-terrorist finance, and then that gets transferred over into drugs, and then drugs goes back, and you kind of have this steady uh, expansion that goes on in terms of the authorities themselves. 
Um, it's the same thing with national security letters. As I mentioned, many of those are not applied to terrorism, the delayed notice search uh, warrants, uh, so on and so forth. The habeas changes in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Again, I give many examples where, in fact, the question that we're asking, what's needed in the short term for this particular threat, turns out not to happen because First of all, you don't know who the terrorists are. That's the point. They're very hard to detect. This is part of their modus vivendi, modus operandi. And what ends up happening is you end up applying it more broadly, and it's not limited to terrorism. They end up being applied more broadly throughout criminal law. So what about the third point where the legislature can really provide a check? Well, this is the oversight provisions. Turns out that the United States and the United Kingdom have a slightly different record on this score. In the United States, we had separation of powers and balance of powers built into our constitutional structure. We didn't anticipate a two-party state where party loyalties could override constitutional divisions. This idea of aligning an individual with their particular office and offsetting that office against another falls apart when you have a party loyalty that overrides that division and that balance of power. And this was really brought home to me in April of 2005 when uh, the Senate, uh, somebody from the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee came to Stanford, uh, who was a Democrat, and I said, what's happening with national security letters? You know, this is, this is incredible. You have tens of thousands of these being issued a year. Bart Gelman of the, um, uh, see at the Post now, had just reported about these NSLs. This was just now reaching the public domain. And he said, well, we really must have a hearing on this. Now this is four years into the Patriot Act's operation with tens of thousands of NSLs being issued every year and no oversight being conducted by our legislature over these NSLs. Zero oversight whatsoever. It was entirely within the executive branch. Well, what about OMB? You know, what about using budgetary authorities as a way to oversee it? OMB, it turns out, has not actually conducted any oversight of the CIA since 1976. That was the last time they audited the CIA. The CIA is entirely wholly contained within itself, so you don't have these kind of external checks. Well, what about the United Kingdom? Well, the United Kingdom is an interesting story because there they have parliamentary supremacy. So the government automatically holds plenary power in parliament. And what they've done in the UK over decades is actually built up a series of administrative controls over the exercise of their surveillance authorities, for example. Uh, there they have uh, a shadow cabinet and an opposition party system, of course. They have independent reviewers who actually go and look at each statute and how it actually operates. And for the independent reviewers, they select members of the judiciary who are retired, who have served at a very high level in the judicial system and are seen as nonpartisan in a way that our judiciary has become very politicized, their judiciary has not. And so they actually have these very senior figures that are seen as nonpartisan that actually can look at how the legislation works. They also have individuals who are appointed to look at specific operations of authorities across statute. So they'll look at all of the surveillance provisions in uh, how MI5 exercises their surveillance, how MI6 uh, exercises it, GCHQ, which is our NSA equivalent, um, and, and RUC Special Branch. They actually look at the operation of these authorities within the structures themselves. They also have formal inquiries frequently into specific instances, into specific provisions that have been put into place. They will put together a formal inquiry to actually look at this. Um, and they also have ombudspersons. So if you feel that you've been unfairly placed under surveillance, you can actually appeal to a tribunal. The tribunal will look into your case and you have some sort of recourse. How effective are these provisions? That's up for question. Uh, the tribunal, for instance, has only in one instance in 15 years actually upheld any sort of complaint that has been put before it. But there are a series of overlapping jurisdictional administrative oversight mechanisms that they have built into their system, which we do not have in the United States. So I'll turn to the judiciary, and then I'd like to open it so we can uh, get a discussion going. Um, but how effective is the judiciary is, is the next question. The United Kingdom, again, we have constitutional concerns that come into play, where the judiciary until recently, for the most part, would only rule uh, an action uh, that was taken by the government if it was ultra-virus or not, meaning outside the authority, the statutory authority that Parliament had given uh, for that specific action. They don't have a written constitution in the United States. Uh, they have a number of written documents that they use that form their constitution, um, but they don't have one specific document as we do um, in terms of that the courts can look to to find legislation constitutional or not. 
From 1998, the courts in the UK became more active in this regard because they incorporated the European Convention of Human Rights into domestic law as a sort of, uh, it, 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 it's a major constitutional change because what they have to do now is the courts can find a statute to be a violation of the ECHR. That doesn't invalidate the statute, but they then have to, they, they issue a statement that says this statute is in violation of the ECHR. Parliament can then choose to keep the statute. That's up to Parliament, but it has not chosen to do so to override the law lord's finding in this case. They will change the statute, and they have with regard to counter-terrorist law. Uh, in the United States, it turns out that, that our courts have been extremely weak um, in regards to performing any sort of a check over executive authorities here. And I think a lot of this is structural. Um, if you look even at life and liberty, where they have been most willing to step forward, for instance, in regard to Guantanamo Bay and the cases that have come from there, they're mostly procedural decisions that the courts have offered. They're not dealing with the substantive rights claims that are coming out of there. Outside of that, they've been very reluctant to step forward. Uh, for one, m the most important reason is that Counterterrorism is a national security concern, and this is seen as within the executive's purview. This is not the court's expertise. It's not what they do. They don't want to second guess uh, the executive, and in fact, they feel constitutionally barred from doing so when it goes into the realm of foreign relations, especially, um, or national security of the United States itself. There's an added element in property rights issues. So that executive order 13224 I mentioned before, because it's an administrative law issue. The courts are particularly deferential to the executive at that time. And so you have kind of a perfect storm in a way in ter coming together of these types of areas. So the courts really aren't going to be the ones who are going to be stepping up and playing a particularly involved role in terms of looking at how these powers are used, of uh, how, for instance, in surveillance, how long the information is kept, with whom it's shared, uh, who sees it, who ver verifies the validity of it, what are the different programs underway. Uh, all of this is kind of outside the scope of, of judicial review. So as I said, the accretion of executive power is really the hallmark of counterterrorist law. And time and again, these incremental progressions are justified under this security or freedom rubric. Uh, but this dichotomy really overlooks many grave and complex problems. Uh, the key to addressing these, I suggest, really lies with the legislature. Despite the minimal role it has taken so far, I'd like to conclude by offering a couple of suggestions of ways in which the legislature could step forward here. Uh, first, I think that it's very important for the legislature to exhibit a culture of restraint, uh, to resist this idea of extraordinary provisions right after an attack under an abbreviated timeline, uh, and in fact to step back and instead have an inquiry. First, find out what went wrong before you automatically introduce new provisions. Uh, second, I think it's important to, to actually reject sunset provisions. And I know this is going out on a limb to, to an extent. Uh, I, I know I can get, I, I'll, I'll get attacked on all sides for this. But here's the problem with sunset provisions. It changes the question. So instead of saying, what do we want long term for our state? What are we willing to live with overall that could be applied across the board? We ask the wrong question. We say, what do we want in the short term to stop the IRA, Al-Qaeda, whatever that group may be, whatever that individual might be. But that's not how the provisions end up playing out within the state itself. The third thing I would suggest is accountability, to really reinforce these concepts of transparency and accountability by strengthening Freedom of Information Act regime um, and by policing these classification procedures. Uh, in the book, I talk about these in more depth. Um, I have a, a lot of concerns about the, uh, the way in which classification procedures in the United States and changes in FOIA in the UK have been developing. Uh, and I think this is something that we really need to be a little bit more careful about, especially as we're giving more and more authorities to the state itself. Fourth, uh, maintaining the lines between criminal law and counterterrorism and within national security itself. I've mentioned in anti-terrorist finance some examples where we, for instance, we use the suspicious activity reports, which are money laundering tools, and we've tried to apply them to terrorism, to anti-terrorist finance, and they're really inappropriate. Uh, in the process, we've also, by the way, with many of our requirements, we've stopped remittances from flowing to a number of regions outside the United States. And as a result, we're seeing uh, areas in Yemen and UAE where Al-Qaeda is reforming, and there's no civil society there to offset the threat that's being caused by this growing fundamentalism outside. Um, there's another example, which I haven't yet touched on, and that's in regard to knowledge-based speech. Uh, the United States, we have a history of allowing nuclear material and nuclear speech uh, to be classified. Under the International Atomic Energy Act, 
information is classified from birth. So no matter if you develop a nuclear weapon with your own money, you're a private citizen, as soon as you develop it, it's classified under our, underneath our legislation. And we have court cases that support that under our First Amendment. The problem comes with biological weapons. So what happened was in uh, a few years before 9-11, there was an experiment that was conducted in Australia where every four or five years the rodent population explodes and their crops suffer for this. And so they wanted to try to stop this explosion of the rodent population. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to spread a disease that stopped rodents from reproducing, but didn't just kill them all because then they would have problem of disease. So they chose a, a, a smallpox variant, uh, mousepox, and they made a very simple biological change to it. Now it required three feet of countertop and $1,000. It was a basic, any grad student in microbiology could actually do this experiment. And what they found when they shut off the gene, uh, one of the genes inside this, this virus, was that they had a 100% lethality rate from mousepox. Now, smallpox is perhaps one of the greatest diseases um, that has killed more people in human history than any other disease. And this, was, this had profound implications for biological weapons. The question was, was should they publish it or not, this, this finding? Well, they initially they didn't. And so what they did was they gave it to the Australian military. But after two years, the Australian military hadn't done anything with it. And they decided to publish it in the United States in Science, in one of our journals. This was in February 2001. When the article came out, people you know, kind of looked at it. They said, we really have to do something about that. The NIH actually gave a grant to some scientists, a group of international scientists who were working up in the northern, uh, northern United States. And the problem you know, was thought to be, you know, well, that's a problem. We need to address it. Then came the anthrax mailings. And what ended up happening was the White House called the editor of uh, these journals. There are a number of microbiology journals all published by the same publisher. He called them to the White House and basically said, you will not publish any articles that terrorists can use for biological weapons. The problem is in microbiology is that microbiology is incremental. And a lot of the findings that can be used for good can also be used for ill. Now, we have tens of thousands of people who are dying from the flu every year and from other diseases in the United States. What happens if we start to stop microbiologists from being able to publish? And there was a lot of noise going on in Congress about this, about whether they were going to allow microbiologists to publish, whether they were going to introduce new legislation to stop microbiologists from being able to publish. Um, and the problem here is that if you look at our constitutional law, there's nothing wrong with this because it's all developed in the nuclear age. But I would suggest that for knowledge-based speech, we should think very carefully about what kind of speech we want to outlaw or not. And the, the the mousepox example is a very good one because in this instance, the group that NIH funded actually came up with a way to address this and published the results actually in a British journal uh, when they were done with it and the problem was alleviated. And here was a perfect example where because we had the information, we were able to address that. Uh, and so I think there should be a strong reluctance even within national security and a careful drawing of lines, really carefully looking at the threat posed and how best to counter that particular threat and not necessarily just borrowing from other areas as a way to redress what might be seen as a national security threat uh, within the United States. The fifth uh, and final suggestion would be a strong res resistance to alter the judicial rules in particular. And here I'm thinking about extended detention, administrative detention, for instance. Uh, here, the courts are already in such a weak position that the more they become marginalized, the less and less of a role they're going to be able to play on these provisions. We now stand uh, on the threshold of this nuclear and biological age that I mentioned, and we may see the use of weapons that are far more destructive than what we have hitherto seen. What steps will these leading liberal democratic states take to protect themselves from potential harm? If we're to judge by these patterns that I've been discussing, their responses may fundamentally change the structure of both countries. We may in the end want that structure to change. That might be what we want to happen. But if we do, that is the conversation we need to have. Backing into it by asking what do we need in the short term to counter a specific threat is the wrong way to proceed. Yet that's the approach we're currently taking, blinded to the broader and more profound effects and the more profound costs of our counter-terrorist regime. And with that, I'd like to open it to questions and discussion. Thanks. Yes, please. Wow. I, I'm amazed. Um, and my question is, why doesn't the, uh, I feel like I'm feeling informed, I understand the media is loaded. So why doesn't the public notice um, the Senate Patriot Act um, 
what you what you mentioned about if you're you know if Kim is labeled as a terrorist, basically everybody who know, sh who knows her, which is everybody at this company, basically everything is seized immediately. I mean, this. Why doesn't the public know this? That's my main question. I mean, again, I understand the media is probably behind it, but you know, really, how can we get this out? Okay, so that's a good question. Why, why, isn't, why isn't this more widely known? And, and there are really three parts I'll give to my answer. Uh, the first is a cumulative point. One of the things that really struck me when I wrote this book um, was when you get all the information in one place, it's overwhelming. You know, when you actually look at the whole picture. The problem is, is our discussions tend to be, is it okay for the NSA to intercept conversations between Al-Qaeda and U.S. citizens when they're calling them abroad? You know, that's a pretty narrow question. But if we start saying, look, what is the panoply of powers that are now in place? That's a very different question. And that kind of cumulative view of what all is going on starts creating patterns. We haven't been addressing it cumulatively. If you look at Congress, it's designed 18 different committees in Congress deal with counterterrorism. It's very hard to follow what all is happening in counterterrorism, even for people who do it full time, because each committee is having their hearings. And each committee focuses on different things, uh, the ones that do hold hearings. There's all sorts of efforts to introduce new initiatives. Everybody wants to look tough on terrorism. It's all very compartmentalized, and it's very hard to kind of draw those into one place to put the picture together of what all is happening. I think there's a second problem um, as well. And so you mentioned these anti-terrorist finance, Executive Order 13224. So under that uh, provision, 900 individuals and 600 entities have had their assets uh, frozen um, underneath this. Uh, do you want to hazard a guess to what number of those are uh, majority community members? <laughs> You know, 98% of the people and 96% of the orgs are all Arab Muslim or appear to be. If you go through, as I did, go through the lists of names, go through the list of origins of these individuals. And so it doesn't hit most of the community. So people say, and this is one of the problems with the security of freedom, it's not everybody's freedom, right? It's, it's this particular community's freedom that's, that they're giving up their rights underneath this new regime, this new rubric. Um, and this is a real problem because if, when it hits the minority, the majority then doesn't get upset about it and do something about it. Uh, when I went back to New York, I spoke to investment bankers back there who are very aware of these provisions in the Patriot Act that changed the IEPA and then the e Executive Order EO 13224 um, because their assets can be frozen if they actually do business with certain Islamic charities. So a number of the banks have informal policies not to do business with Islamic charities because they don't want their assets to be frozen. And one bank has had their assets frozen over this. So what does that do to our ability for our uh, minority community in the United States to uh, fulfill the religious obligations of zakat? What does it do to the funding of these various regions where we actually want some of the charities to be operating? You know, what does this do? What are the broader effects of this? Nobody's looking into it because people are scared. And if you think about it, that life, liberty, and property are kind of the fundamental tenets of liberal democracy, it's extraordinary that there's not an outcry, you know, about this in Title III of the Patriot Act. We see no discussion of Title III. And this gets me to the third point, and I raised this with, um, with the ACLU, with Anthony Romero and the ACLU. I said, why isn't the ACLU taking a leading role on this? This is a really important issue to actually look at. And he said, it's very hard to explain this to the public. This is all, you know, all the financial regulations, they are complex, they are convoluted, they do deal with all these finer points. And he said, it's much easier to explain torture, to explain detention, to explain these kind of more tangible things. But at some level, there's kind of an overload issue and you have to choose which issues you work on. I, you know, I take that point, but if you don't have any interest groups who are standing up for this, if the minority community is already in a weak position, the majority community is scared of running afoul of the measures. You know, it's not surprising that we don't see more about anti-terrorist finance in EO 13224. Um, there's finally a case going through the courts, Al Harman. Now, this, this is an incredible case. What's, what's really interesting about this, one of the things I didn't mention, is when they freeze your assets, you know, so how do you bring suit against the government? When your assets are frozen, you have no money. Right? And anybody who helps you is in violation of the statute, including legal advice, right? is in violation of the statute. So how do you bring a case in court? So what happened with this particular group, they had their assets frozen for four years in Oregon. This is Al Harriman International Foundation, Oregon. Their assets were frozen for four years. You have to apply to Treasury, to OFAC in particular, the Office of Foreign um, Assets Control. You have to apply to them and ask them for your money back so that you can bring suit against them certain conflict of interest here you know, going on. And you, know, you might think this is kind of an academic concern, 
Well, guess what they did? They said, you can't use your money to sue us. You know, you can't use your money to find a lawyer and stuff. You could raise money internationally from another fund, but you can't use any of your US assets to do this. For four years, finally, they were able to bring suit. OFAC changed its policy and said, OK, you can use your US funds, but you can only hire two lawyers. OFAC, in the meantime, hired five to fight the case. You know, this is a problem. This is a real problem. So these cases are starting to come to court. We'll see what, what happens, whether the judiciary is going to take a leading role or not. But if you take into account the cumulative nature, the fact that it affects the minority community, and the problem of having interest groups actually take on these issues, I think those would be kind of the three top reasons why we're not seeing more discussion of these issues. Uh, can I ask another question? Is this uh, talk going to be published on YouTube? And can we publish it on YouTube? Uh, yes. Great, thank yeah, you. Thanks. Um, how, how do you feel that, that the use of signing standards by the administration to ignore various pieces of, of law that they just don't care for um, is, is going to affect this? I mean, it, it's already an issue of balance when the legislature says, okay, we're making a law preventing you from, from doing you know, behavior X. And they just say, well, we're just not going to enforce it. What are you going to do? Yeah. So, so the question is, what about these signing statements? And how do you respond when the executive just says, well, even though the legislature has done this, we're still not going to act in accordance with it? Um, the constitutional nature of these is in question. This is a big debate right now in the legal academy, the extent to which these signing statements have constitutional validity, what would happen in a court, and so on. They haven't really been challenged. Um, I talk about these a little bit in the book because it does come up in regard to the torture provisions. And it comes up in regard to the Military Commissions Act and the Detainee Treatment Act. Uh, because uh, after this Herculean kind of battle uh, back and forth with McCain and with Congress, nevertheless, the president added a signing statement to this kind of saying, well, we're going to persevere under Article II authorities, which is absolute under our unitary executive regime, and we have all the power you know, to do what's necessary for national security of the United States. So it was, they, they nevertheless pursued the signing statement kind of uh, path to it. Now, what would happen in a court? I'm not sure. I, it hasn't been challenged. So I don't know exactly how that would play out in the courts themselves. Hasn't this administration been using a lot more of the signing statements than, pre than previously? So this is, this is under question right now. There is evidence on both sides. And I haven't looked closely at it enough to come down on one side or the other on that. Um, there, this is a growing trend. I mean, there are, there are a number of growing trends that in some ways we're seeing uh, just a continuation of what's happened before. And this is why I looked for four decades. I wanted to get some perspective on what's happening. Uh, a good example is uh, this uh, Executive Order 13224, which you had mentioned. Uh, this was introduced under the International Economic uh, Emergency uh, Powers Act, IEEPA. Uh, the IEEPA was introduced in 1977 because we had uh, a statute, which the abbreviation is TWIA, uh, the Trading with the Enemy Act, which was used to put economic sanctions on foreign countries during times of war. And it was being abused. It was being used during uh, peacetime as well. And so Congress introduced the IEEPA to try to constrain the executive in its use of economic sanctions. What ended up happening was for the first 23 years of the IEEPA's existence, most most of the economic sanctions were applied to states or to actors that were associated with other states themselves. Um, President Clinton, however, broke rank. And he started applying these to Palestinian and Jewish groups who were threatening the Middle East peace process. After that, he applied it to narcotics traffickers uh, connected with Colombian narcotics trade. He connected it to individuals trading in weapons of mass destruction, materials, so the proliferation of fissile material, biological weapons, nuclear, chemical, and radiological material. Um, then it, during, so that brought us up until the Bush administration. Since the Bush administration first took office in 2001, there have been 32 uh, executive orders issued under the IEPA, as opposed to 23 in the entire history. You know, in 23 years, you know, there were few, much fewer, 22 years, there were 23 issued. Suddenly, you have this increase in the number, and the nature changes. So now we have economic sanctions on anyone threatening the democratic process in Cote d'Ivoire. We have anybody threatening uh, the democratic process in Belarus, uh, anybody threatening uh, in Darfur, uh, so on and so forth. We have kind of this expansion and the application of what was previously state sanctions to individuals. Now, this wasn't created by the Bush administration. The Clinton administration was the one that broke ranks and started applying this to individuals. But we've seen a shift in the intensity, the expansion of powers, this idea that if you are associated with somebody suspected of terrorism, that's a radical expansion, but it's not, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's continuing a trajectory that actually goes further back. I'm quite surprised because what you described is um, that 
it's really the laws that are bad, like the justification for a certain law was a counter-terrorism, but there is no counter-terrorism mentioned in the law, so it is used everywhere. There could have been a better situation like making the law specifically talking about counter-terrorism and still the government not following the law. It could have been that the government is following such a law, but there are individuals that are using the law uh, illegally. Um, my question is, relating to the situation you described, can it be even worse? I mean, is there a situation that can be even worse than the situation right now? Except, uh, I mean, what I see are different levels of doing it the wrong way, fighting terrorism the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So is there a more wrong way to do it? I mean, just to know what mm -hmm. to expect. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me think about this for a moment. So how, how I would approach this. I think both are going on right now. I think both we have laws that are not sufficiently tailored, don't have sufficient oversight authorities, have not built into place due process, uh, the basic requirements of notice, a hearing, an opportunity to contest the evidence against you. Um, we have both that going on and we have a violation of law going on. The NSA wiretapping operation, we have FISA, which was created specifically to deal with exactly what this NSA wiretapping operation was introduced to deal with. They just didn't want to bother going through the 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act requirements. Um, I find that extraordinary. That was a violation of the law. And the, under the 1947 uh, Emergency Powers Act, they, they needed to, National Security Act, they needed to inform Congress that this was going on. They, needed, they, didn't, they didn't even undertake the most rudimentary of steps that would have legalized this program. So if you look at Guantanamo Bay and what's happened in Guantanamo Bay with the suspension of habeas corpus, if you look at the treatment of prisoners, the suspension of the Geneva Convention, all of this, I, in my view, many of these are outside the law. So I think that is going on. If you look at the treatment of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, if you look at, uh, sorry, Abu Ghraib, if you look at rendition, we've had two cases on rendition come before the United States, both dismissed on state secrets grounds. Now these are when we take individuals and we fly them to other countries where they're subjected to torture under questioning. And these are countries that our own State Department has listed all of the ways in which these countries torture people and has rejected it. We have all sorts of ways where I think that this administration has gone around the law. Um, so I think that is going on. Could it be worse? It can always be worse, right? Um, and it could be better. And I think it, we, need to, need, we need to take a look now at it because I feel like we're right on the edge of something here because we haven't fully felt the effects. I work at a center where people work full time on CBW, chemical and biological weapons, and, and nuclear weapons as well. Um, and we're right on the edge of what's coming up, and I'm not sure that we're, our constitutional structure will withstand what will happen if we continue these patterns. And that's why I feel it's really important to look at it now and to think hard now. And as I said, there may be ways we want the law to change. We may want to have uh, you know, delayed notice search warrants, but we may want to build into that statute some sort of oversight authority, some sort of transparency and accountability, even if it's not transparent to everybody publicly, at least to people in Congress with security clearances who can look at this. And we need to think very hard about where we are right now before we move into this new era. That's what I'm, that's where my concerns are. So could it be worse? Yes. Could it be better? Yes. Are we violating the law? Right now, are there violations of law that have occurred? In my view, yes. That's for the courts to determine. Um, and are there ways in which the law is not sufficiently tailored? Yes. Just, just the uh, continuation. Continuation. You, you explained before that right now there is no, um, um, let's say, uh, much interest in changing it because most of the groups are not affected by this, uh, by current situation. Uh, what are the steps that are made, if are made, to try to change the situation? So, th so there's an interesting issue here. Um, and this is, this is not uncommon for counterterrorism law. You have to show, for instance, to bring a case against them, you have to have standing. How do you show you've been under surveillance if you don't have access to the information, if all of it's classified? You know, um, you also have to have standing to bring suit for these uh, financial provisions. And the courts have found that an individual who might have their assets frozen because they're associated with somebody suspected of terrorism is too attenuated. You actually have to have your assets frozen, in which case you have this conflict of interest issue in, in terms of gaining access. Is it, so, so even judicially, you have this problem of bringing challenge even by those who are affected 
by the provisions themselves. Now, as for other people, I think it's a matter of actually just raising these issues in discussion and trying to get more attention, especially from the legislature. I really see the legislature as being key here because they're the ones who are in a position to be able to perform these functions if they can perform them effectively. Isn't that a, a pretty classic example of, of not really being much in the way of supervision since they rarely, yeah. I mean, it's less than one-tenth of one percent of the, of the warrants get rejected. Yeah. And so, they have, what, three days after they've actually searched you to even ask, before they even have to ask for the... So, so the issue, is, so in order to get a FISA warrant, you have a reduced standard um, that's used. It's not our Title III search warrants. It's one that's been kind of weakened in order to allow for greater latitude for foreign, uh, for, for the issuance of warrants to pick up foreign s national security information. Um, the FISA court has been very lenient, you know, out of, I, I forget the exact numbers, I have them in the book, out of 10,000, you know, one was denied or something, you know, something ridiculous like this. It's like, however, and, and this is interesting because this argument comes up in both the British and the American context. I've talked to people from various British intelligence agencies as well, and they say that even having that check there performs an important internal administrative function, which is you don't go to a FISA court if you think you're going to get denied. So it actually does have this kind of unseen um, effect on developing cases, on what you go to them with, how often you open FISA investigations, and so on. Um, and I, I've been told by people at the Bureau, by people who work on these issues, uh, both in the United States as well as in the British context, where as well it's an administrative system that they have, um, and they deny very few that come before it, and so on, um, that they actually, it creates, it creates a check, uh, internal check on these organizations. So I can't speak to that, you know, the degree to which it really does, but that is one of the arguments that's put forward for that. Sorry, you had. Um, do you see signs that the executive uses these um, situations of terrorist attacks to um, intentionally broaden its power, or is it just um, that uh, it's more like carelessness that these law are um, implemented as they are. So uh, yeah. So uh, so it's it's intentional. There's no question. It's an intentional expansion of power. Um, after 9/11, the word came down. What do you want um, to the FBI? You know, kind of pull open the bottom drawer. What is it you've been wanting all these years? This is your chance to get it through. I and mean, there's no question that there's this is a purposeful pursuit of power. And in a way, that's the executive's job in some sense. You know, they their job is to protect the citizens uh, in the administration of the law to, to protect individuals within the state as well. They're going to be held accountable if they're not. So they're seeking the broadest powers they can in order to be able to do this. Okay, then let me refresh this a bit. Is, is, this, um, is this intentionally used to broaden the powers beyond um, the scope of fighting terrorism, or is it just that they want to um, uh, have more power in order to fight terrorism. Yeah, no, I think it's they intentionally try to expand their powers. If you look at many of the provisions of the Patriot Act, it's for pornography, it's for um, you know child abuse, it's for you know all sorts of things you know that actually don't fall just within the terrorism realm. Um, it, uh, there's no question that they purposefully put this stuff in there because it's an opportunity for them to get authorities that they've been wanting to be able to you know stop people from doing bad things to people. You know, and and you know so in a sense, I guess what I'm trying to get at. Is is in a, you know, a, a part of me, I don't, you know, I, I see this. You know, this is, this is one of their functions. If they want to stop pedophiles, and this is their chance to get through provisions that they think will help them do that, that's, that's how they act. Now, how is that going to be offset by some sort of check on these authorities to make sure they're not being abused? I think that's a separate question. But I, and I don't see this as dependent on the specific administration uh, in the United States, for instance, or in Britain. If you look at labor and what labor introduced, um, I find it kind of extraordinary. Right now you find in the House of Lords these extraordinary statements that we've never detained people without charge. That's an anathema to the British Constitution. And it's as though they they ignored the whole Northern Ireland you know, saga where they had tens of thousands of people that they interned. Operation Demetrius started off the whole detention of individuals in Northern Ireland, most of whom were not associated with terrorism in any way. Um, there's this idea, but that was under a conservative government, you know. So 
and now you have a labor government in, and labor's doing the same thing. Like, I don't see it as dependent on the particular party that's in power. I see it as an executive function uh, more. And I really see the responsibility on the legislature. They're the ones passing the laws to provide some sort of a check, uh, at least within the United States context. In Britain, it's more complicated because you have this plenary power issue going on uh, in terms of their parliamentary system and their constitutional structure. But certainly within the United States, I would see it as within Congress's realm to then look at that very carefully. And they might want new authorities to catch pedophiles and to stop pornography and so on. Um, and then it's up to them to build into the statutes the requisite uh, mechanisms to make sure that those powers are not abused, that they actually are used for the purpose for which they're intended. Right, so I think there are a few. I, uh, one is, um, certainly from the legislative perspective, to actually institute inquiries following a terrorist attack immediately before any sort of legislation is introduced, I think that's very important. Um, I also think it's important that they uh, don't use extraordinary procedures, that they actually go through their committee stages, they go through the votes, they go through the amendments, they go through all the stages that are necessary in order to act a measure, in order to allow the different interested parties, whether they're you know the majority party, the minority party, what they are, to, to weigh in on these issues. Um, I think it's very important that they continue to separate national security uh, and from criminal law and to think very carefully about the lines between them to try to cr prevent this creepage over into the other areas. Um, and that they stop using sunset provisions and instead they, they really think very hard about what they want over the long term uh, for these types of powers for the state itself. Uh, I think we have some very hard thinking to do constitutionally about our two-party state and what that does to separation of powers and checks and balances that the framers created. You know, if you go back and read the Federalist Papers, it's as salient today as it was, you know, hundreds of years ago. And in many ways, I think we've, we've gone so far into one side that we really need to revisit some of these constitutional questions and look at how our Congress forms committees. Look at who has the authority to call witnesses. Look at how oversight mechanisms are built in in a way that, you know, just as Rawls did with this theory of justice, you know, that you don't know what position you'll have in the society's theory of justice. You know, we should create a legislature like that. And I think in many ways, uh, it's become so partisan and so moved into party politics that we've lost some of those fundamental checks that as a constitutional matter are fundamental to the United States. Thanks. Thank you very right, much, Rob.